long day, I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Cowth. And we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Tan Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the street till I know I... Well, hello, Father Winslow. Well, hello, Father. Welcome back. Happy Easter. Uh, happy Easter to you. Happy Easter to... But by the po- time people hear this, it might actually be Pentecost. <laughs> <laughs> so the last time we got together, um, it was before Palm Sunday. Yeah. And... Sorry uh, for the delay, because... Obviously, we kind of had this... We're busy. Yeah. I mean... You want your priest Holy to be busy. Week, exactly. If your priest is not busy on Holy Week, there's a problem. Right. And if he's right. not trying to relax and enjoy Easter on Easter week... There's, a, There's problem. a problem. Yeah. So, Which means you didn't do anything during Easter a- week. <laughs> <laughs> Holy week. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so they kind of go hand in hand. So oh. having a two-week delay on our normal routine is par for the course when it comes to Holy week um, and Easter week. Indeed. Indeed. But we are still right in the midst of Easter glory. And so perhaps we could um, talk a little bit about that. In particular... One of the things that strikes me relative to the early church is the fact that they didn't exactly have massively significant blueprints. On the one hand, you do have the enlightenment by the Holy Spirit, which is not a small thing, mm-hmm. um, to lead them into all truth, to teach them all that he, he has taught them, to remind them of everything he ever said, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there must have been those moments in which they were sort of fascinated by what they were able to do. Just uh-huh. as with, when they came back, for example, when he invested them with some authority and they were going out two by two, they came back and they were so excited that even the demons were subject to us. So there was this sort of playful fascination. And I, I got to thinking about it this morning because the gospel and the readings sort of hinted at this, certainly the, the reading from the Acts of the Apostles. This is was the, the moment in which the apostles They were thrown into prison, and the angel comes and lets them out of prison. The Sadducees are together. They're preaching again in the temple area, and no one knows how they got out of the prison. And I got to thinking to myself, it it must, it was so, so, so quick after Pentecost that this all happened. And so Peter must have stopped and said to himself with the other apostles huddled in the prison at some point, saying, well, I'm not sure if it was supposed to go down like this, <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> and then they have this incredible thing happen where the angel releases them. And so I guess... The which, thing that... which mirrors Jesus rising from the tomb. Like yes. In a certain sense, there, yes. it's, a, it's a type of rolling back the stone. It is. It is. And so I, 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 it got me thinking about my childhood, actually, relative to whenever you got those, those, those moments of a newfound freedom... Remember when you got your first bike, but you didn't know how to ride it? Maybe to the trading wheels. I don't know. I was a natural. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I, you, you were out there on the unicycle. I remember the banana seat? I think I had a banana seat. <laughs> I'm pretty the banana sure. Seat. I had a banana seat. That was probably the coolest thing around, the banana seat. <laughs> oh, my heavens. I forgot about the banana seat. Oh, yeah. Um, but when you got your first bike, I remember I had training wheels, and I just I, I took them off. I was like, I can do this. Mm-hmm. And so my father was the one to kind of hold the back of my seat in the beginning. And when he let go, I just remember this incredible sense of freedom because I was in some sense going faster with more ease than I had ever gone before. The same sort of thing when you drive for the first time, you have this new sense of freedom and, and because you have a new kind of power underneath you. And so mm-hmm. I, I just want to wonder what it was like for them to have these newfound powers at their disposal, the authority of Christ, the power of Christ, um, not just to, to heal um, or to, to read souls or to, uh, to have this, these miracles happen, like getting out of, out of prison, but in the sense that you don't know what's going to happen. Like you don't even know what kind of power you have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, 
it's interesting you know you know that series the chosen that's out there that mm. people been been watching and what's so good about it is that um it does try to put you there and to experience it the way they experienced it so like for you you just have done this reflective intellectual exercise on what it would be like to have a new power and that mm. new freedom and how you would uh, what, it, what, it would, what it would be like. What they can do with a television series like this is they can portray it well. Right, right. right. So when you're watching these guys go out uh, as they were sent by our Lord and cast out demons and heal people and do all of those uh, amazing things um, that our Lord sent them out to do, to forgive sins, to walk away free from their shackles, to watch it, it's easier to put yourself in their, yes. in their shoes. It's one of the benefits of having... These different type of art forms, movies like The Passion of the Christ or, yes. uh, or or The Chosen, when they're well done, they allow you to relate and to experience uh, using that medium in in a, in a different kind of way than yeah. maybe you wouldn't have gotten there with your own imagination. So, but in any event, I, I bring that up because I'd been watching uh, the series with my parents uh, during Easter week, you know, the, the season three, and that's precisely what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so as you're describing your reflections, uh, I have to say I got to it rather differently, maybe a little more lazily because I was watching <laughs> it on a show The Chosen. But nonetheless, I did have a little bit of the same reaction. Yeah. What well, that would it, have been like for them to go out. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, they, they, the actors portrayed it well. Yes. And the directors and producers they portrayed it well because they're amazed, right? What is right. passing through me? Um, what is passing through me? That's truly, a good way to truly put extraordinary. It. And it, I, it's funny you bring that up because it, it is the thing that I went to next. I didn't go watch the series per se, mm -hmm. um, but I thought about that. You know that that affected me when I saw The Passion, which was twenty years ago now. Yeah. Um, in such a way that I remember sitting on. I went to the theater to see it, and of course, the whole place. It's not like exactly a movie you're going to sit and eat popcorn at, right? Right. Um, you get to the end of it, and I'm not sure if this was your experience, but. No one said a word. No one. And everyone just walked out of the theater. And I remember I went home and I went with a, some friends of mine. We didn't talk in the car. I dropped them off. I went back to the rectory. And I sat down outside against the wall. And I, I remember thinking to myself, what have I done to you, Lord? Not just in terms of the sin and the, and the passion that took place there, but insofar as I had, I had begun to make him um, abstract in my mind. That there's a sort of disincarnation of the word himself. Yeah. And then it, it put flesh into those things and it impacted me greatly, which I think the chosen has done as well. I think the temptation that we often have is when we think about St. Peter or St. Paul or any of the apostles, especially if you've done any traveling and you've, you've seen them depicted in art so many mm -hmm. times in two-dimensional images and three-dimensional images, wood, stone, right. uh, whatever the medium but of course, they're always they're always depicted as that moment of glory, you know, with keys in hand or tiara on head, mm. um, which we should. I mean, I, I don't like the opposite either, where we think that they're just nothing but regular Joes. I mean, they were regular Joes that did extraordinary things because of the power that they had. And so somewhere in between there, to, to catch their wonder at the whole thing and their excitement, yeah, and yet to realize that they're not just fisherman anymore that's kind of the whole point mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i agree i mean and these are art forms and you know it's right to speak that's, of them that's lupo again by the way yes he came, that's he true came, he wanted to come to this recording session <laughs> that's one of the great danes lying on the floor <laughs> uh, i think that was it was it wasn't quite a snore it was uh he was disgruntled by a what deep you were breath saying. no clearly not <laughs> lupo loves me um and totally agrees with me in all of our disputes <laughs> So, no, I, I think referring to these different types of art forms and putting a show like The Chosen or a film like The Passion, and now uh, apparently Mel Gibson's is working, he's working on The Resurrection, mm. to put them in the category of modern art forms uh, along with the more traditional art forms and to understand that they have limits. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to fill in gaps. They have to be speculative. But so does any other art form. Uh, Whatever you're doing to try to depict those those characters, it's not going to be a source of uh, of, of truth. They're just trying to reflect it, 
Right. And so it's an important thing. I, I, I get nervous if people start citing the films as a source <laughs> of revelation. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, no, no, you can't do that. But Jesus said, They're right. No, exactly. I, I don't well, he that. was also kind of dressed in a Renaissance garb in a picture <laughs> that I saw, you know, <laughs> or a painting. So he, he didn't really walk around in that. You have to take the art forms for what they are, understand their limits, understand where they're speculating, understand where they're uh, trying to bridge the gap of time, right? Where right, right, you're using right. expressions that, uh, in the, for example, in the, in the in the series that shows, and they're using expressions that we relate to today uh, in language that we're not. There, there's no equivalent to to back then, but they're trying to communicate in general right. that they would speak this way. You know that they would have speak. They would have spoken normally and colloquially, um, and and certainly that comes across. So you have to kind of really interpret. Uh, what they're reflecting through the limits of the medium and respect the spaces. And I think they've done it well where they're Agreed. speculating. Uh, but you do have to approach it that way and not appeal to it as a source. It makes me nervous. I've, you know, I'm sure you've run into this in the past where people will tell you about exorcism based upon a movie, The Exorcist, or right, right. something like that, or they cite films as being a true and authoritative source. For religion. And Absolutely. that's a little scary. Remember the Dan Brown series, the book? You know, that yes, somehow do. people oh, were talking about that as, as being a historical record. It was a work it, of fiction. It somehow gets into the, the collective consciousness. Yes. About our, now our blessed Lord and Mary Magdalene. Yes. Yeah. And what Opus Dei actually is. And yeah. It is amazing how it infiltrates. But I, I, wonder, I wonder if there's any way... Let me put it this way. Certainly, with some art forms, we were trying to depict the the state of the saints now in glory. So imagine both the icon and even well into the 15th century um, with the the egg tempera and gold and things of that nature. You, you're trying to, to have it not too terribly representational, so it's not just depicting one particular aspect, but something that's a bit more universal that your prayer can can go through it or past it and it doesn't fixate on something more like a baroque period or a renaissance period where you have all sorts of things going on and they're really they're really beautiful but it it does define it as a particular moment in mm -hmm. the way that the art forms preceding that did not um which i love i love that art form too i mean just think about a caravaggio who's not impressed right mm -hmm. or something by Raffaele or michelangelo and as we move down the line to the to the motion media, um, one of the things that it struck me about the chosen relative to that is because they make our Lord so colloquial, too much in my estimation. Yeah, um, just a bit too much of a regular Joe sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, when he has those scenes, maybe this is the intent. When he has those scenes, and he he has many of them, where all of a sudden you you see his divinity sort of come forward. Mm -hmm. um, I think in particular the scene with Nathaniel. Mm -hmm. I don't have any spoilers here. Mm -hmm. But that moment when he says, I saw you, I saw you under the fig tree. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because they depicted him uh, in, in some ways almost uber human, just sort the of contrast. normal human. Yeah. The contrast was so powerful. Yeah. Um, and just that the artist medium, you can do what he wants. And of I course. Did, I may disagree with the over colloquialized Lord. Um, on some level, because he doesn't manifest that in the scriptures. But it's certainly like a Caravaggio, by having so much darkness, it allows the light yes. to be perceived as even being brighter. Yeah, exactly. That chiaroscuro, mm -hmm. indeed. But it's um, kind of coming back to the, the original theme there. Um, I think it's a good practice. You know, we spoke about this years ago. I think it's a really good practice in the Easter season, because I think we all have to some degree, a much more difficult time with Easter season and doing it well rather than Lent. Lent, we sort of get. I, I'm a bit of a disaster. I need some upkeep. I've got to get mm -hmm. serious about this. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, all of that lends itself to greater discipline, greater prayer life, etc. And we begin to reap some of the fruits of that, um, for better, for worse, in terms of our penances. And then we get to Easter and sort of, okay, now it's time to celebrate and rejoice. But it's difficult to celebrate and rejoice, um, especially if you haven't done much <laughs> during Lent. Right. But to sustain that in such a way that it doesn't just become, now let me roll back everything I did during Lent. And, right. And so what it was like for them to have a newfound um, 
insertion into the power of Christ. It's not that different for us, right? I mean, in some sense, we should have some sense of new life. Like I, I, I'm participating in a divine life, a supernatural life, hopefully in a way that I wasn't on Ash Wednesday. And I should experience some kind of new capacity in me. or Something, as you said, flowing through me, as it were. Yeah. You know, I think just from an experiential point of view, obviously there's the relief of the Lenten disciplines insofar as they were sacrificial in nature, you know, not moves toward virtue, you know, for example, Mm -hmm. giving up swearing or things like that. You don't swear like a sailor on Easter Sunday, right? So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not, Happy Easter. But, yeah. beep. Beep, beep. <laughs> you know that's but but the sacrifices you know the the, the sacrifices where you they, they relent and you, you have that release that you experience on Easter but it's so much more than that that's that's just sort of a natural feeling on which uh, from which one can leap into a, a higher spiritual current and I, I have to say I feel that um and I feel I think it just, it simply flows uh, from the current of one's life. You know, if one is living deliberately and conscientiously in the life of the church, especially as regulated by virtue of sacred time in the seasons of the year, uh, there, there is a soaring that occurs naturally during the Easter time, almost a, a permission uh, just to glide a little higher interiorly, and one would hope that you're every year you're you're gaining some elevation that you never lose, uh, such that you know by the end of our lives that uh, what is considered to be our normal flight pattern is mm. fairly high up there. Uh, but I, I have to say, I, I, there is that sense of being able to fly a little higher interiorly, mm. uh, a greater release, a deep a deeper experience of liberation. Yeah, yeah. It, it, because, it, I mean, the Paschal mystery and the reality of our faith, it, you know, when lived and as faith grows stronger, experientially feels more real. Yeah. And as it feels more real, it, it is all the more exhilarating, mm. all the more astounding, all the more seemingly fantastic, um, and yet it's real. And there should be some of that that excitement, not to just reduce things to sort of an emotional reaction, but there should be some of that excitement that the apostles had when there was the newness of it. Like, can you believe what just happened? Yeah. I mean, if, we, if we have eyes to see, and we're living, as we've spoken about before, the life of the spirit like i'm I'm trying to pay attention to what god's doing and not just in some sort of um you're a, you're sort of a wretch and you, know, you, need to, you need to repent that's all true but what is he doing relative to to his grace and power in me that he wants me to do what does he want me to engage in and watch the way he orchestrates all the different lines of my life to put persons in front of me, to give me these opportunities to do things beyond my capacity through me that I, I hardly even notice that he's doing. And then I get to rejoice in the fact that he did it. Um, that's fun. I mean, it's just fun. Yeah. You think about it, if you could live even just one of the person's life. So, I mean, maybe one way to think about it is, is for you being as envious as you are, um, <laughs> just think if you could live both your life and then you could also have my life. Oh, <laughs> I'm exhausted already. I know I'm a working priest. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, for those of you who didn't catch that subtlety, he's suggesting that I am not a working priest. I'm a priest of leisure. He's a priest of leisure. Clearly. Um, Clearly. No, actually, we were we were at a meeting together yesterday, and the meeting it was I don't know a couple hours, and it it drained me to the core. <laughs> Welcome to my it. world. And I thought that's what he does all day long. Oh, all day long. <laughs> in fact, you know that you've arrived when being seated in a meeting becomes an extreme sport. <laughs> I mean, I have to get up and stretch. I got to jog down the hall, you know, just to keep my body in, in, oh, yeah. in, in, in order so that I can endure the incredible amount of uh, sitting that I do. Oh, so there you go. There's a good it's a marathon sitting. While you're sitting there, 
you could be living my life, <laughs> have a whole nother life. And oh. so whatever it is that I'm, you know, engaged in relative to my extreme sports, um, <laughs> you could be enjoying that. I could be. And it's a, it's a silly example because it doesn't quite, the analogy limps obviously because we have bodies. And so mm-hmm. um, it doesn't quite work to yield, wield someone else's body while you're sitting in a different place. And yet one should think about it almost in those terms. I mean, St. Paul says we're, we're going to have the mind, we have the mind of Christ. We talk about the, the Holy Spirit as the, the soul's welcome guest that we're going to make our home with you. That there's I'm actually living a different person's life. And being able to wield his knowledge and his love on some level, that's what faith and charity are. That's, a, that's an astounding thing. I think it truly is. I mean, and there's, there's no going back, but there's so much also to look forward to. Yeah. And there's no going back, one, because one would never want to. But also um, the excitement, because what we leave behind uh, is worth leaving behind. You know, you think of those apostles mm. and the lives that they had. Not that they weren't they weren't good and they weren't seeking to do what was right and good. But when our Lord arrives at the scene and uh, the, the the inbreaking of God through the incarnation and the uh, the whole economy of salvation unfolding in in their very midst. Uh, once you're caught up into that, you can't go back. Yeah, you yeah. You, you just simply cannot. I mean, I, 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 unless you're Judas, right? Um, so maybe you could, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you want to live my life. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> but you. But to think that what all lies ahead um, there, and then, and then. Your sense of time uh, changes. Your perspective on time changes because you're you're very much looking across an eternal horizon. There's a sense of urgency about what needs to get done about the time that you have relative to the mission that was imparted to them, right. which is then imparted to the apostolic church, which is what we're all part of, yeah. uh, from the lay faithful all the way up to the pope and everyone in between. Uh, we're all part of that apostolic church, and we all have that same sense of apostolic mission. Um, but do we look at time that way? Or do we kind of look at the future and look at time in our life the way the apostles did before our Lord arrived on the scene? Mm. Um, something to think about because yeah. this Easter, the Easter season really pulls you in to the, into the current of, our, of, our, of that faith, that apostolic faith, and draws you in in such a way that we shouldn't want to look back, and there's only so much time left to do what needs to be done Amen. and what is being asked of us and to contribute to that economy of salvation and you know, pray God take our place in the kingdom. Amen. I think that uh, when I was walking into the Easter season after I sort of woke up from the, as you know, the, the incredible... Um, and unique liturgies that we have during the Triduum because they are, they're just, you only do them once a year and, and, but they're also very, very intense. And so you get done with the Easter masses and you just sort of, everything in you is just so spent in a good way. Yeah. And when I, so when I finally came to on Easter Monday and realized that I was still (laughs) alive, um, I remember think asking myself that question, okay, what do I leave behind now Mm -hmm. that I want to leave behind? Like, in other words, I'm not just going to jump into this, Easter Monday and say, okay, we're you know back to business back as before usual. Ash, back before yeah, Ash Wednesday, I, right? Yeah. What 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 stays there, yeah. and what do I not come back to? Yeah, that's a good that's a good way of looking at it. Well, before we go, I had the distinct pleasure today of um, preparing for we're having a, an event out here, as you know, for um, yes, working on the. Uh, progress toward building a chapel here at the seminary and uh, some other uh, ancillary buildings that we we want to build to be able to house and welcome other guests from from the diocese and parishioners and things of that nature. Um, and in so doing, I I want to be able to show everyone the actual dimensions mm. of the buildings. And so it was just kind of a fun project today. You didn't do a footprint, did you? We did, and oh. so we actually painted it outside. Really? And so oh, all the that. all the buildings are sort of painted That's and exciting. outlined, so you could get a real sense of the, the magnitude like of it. Um, and since I can't 
really read a map or I can't measure anything. And I'm yeah, I, I wouldn't imagine that. surveying I just, your skill. <laughs> I just, I just had yeah. our wonderful facilities uh, manager uh, do that for me. I've got vision, but no practical skill. Yeah, yeah, surveying's <laughs> now. And you don't have the patience for that. I, I don't really, no. Uh, you like have to, patience, but it's... It's a different kind of patience. It's very selective. That's true. It, it, I'm kind of done with you. Can yeah, you, I know. Can we hang up now? <laughs> Well, that's exciting. Well, I can't wait to take a peek at yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. All right. So um, I just want to say before we go how much I adore the smell of Easter lilies. Mm-hmm. There is, I, you know, I, my chapel at home, mm-hmm. I have the Easter lilies and then I have a, a different variety of lily in the flower um, uh, vases on the altar. And when you walk in, that perfume, that natural perfume, it just envelops you. Yeah. It's so sweet. Yeah. And it speaks of Easter. Obviously, uh, this is something that is cultural because sure. we use Easter lily to represent uh, the Easter season so often um, that the smell becomes so closely aligned, so closely associated with that that joy and elevation of Easter that you walk in and your senses are just just developed and the very the natural scent and perfume of easter i absolutely love it i do too and it's it's one of those things that i like the poinsettia for christmas i mean which doesn't smell per se but of course that 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 ruby red color Mm. that deep red color Mm -hmm. you don't want it any other time of year right and the lily like if i see a lily do another time i don't want to smell it i don't want to smell it it's easter it's easter it's easter (laughs) It's true. So next year, if you don't, if you've never had an Easter lily in your home, oh, strongly yeah. recommend it. Especially if you can close off the doors, and oh, capture it, let it every time, view the room. It just elevates it. Yeah. It elevates you every time you walk by it, and it just gives off its its natural perfume. It's just so, it's such a beautiful, simple little, almost sacramental. Yeah. Of, of Easter, it's sort of the way the guys fill in the house and the sisters. When you walk, when by. I walk by, it's, 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 the, it's the odor of sanctity. <laughs> the odor of sanctity. Well, that's what you call it. <laughs> We'll leave it at that. God bless you all. All right. Bye. Ciao. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen. Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com and remember for more great ways to deepen your faith check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com and we'll see you again next time from the rooftop rooftop